Okay, yeah. right, we'll get going. Um, one of the striking things about your early career is that you actually appeared in West End Productions with fellow greats Peter O'Toole and Richard Harris. In what That's way right. did you, do you think this offered you a grounding on which you could nurture throughout your career? Well, I think actually my grounding came when I went straight from drama school into a repertory theatre um, at Ipswich. And I was there doing a different play once a fortnight for quite a long time, doing different parts and, um, and gaining experience of being on the boards, as it were. Um, and it was from there that I got my first part in West End, um, funnily enough, in, um, in a sort of musical. I had to sing and dance and things like that. Um, and, um, and then I auditioned for a play for J.B. Priestley, who was a very famous, very good writer. Um, and this was his last play. And um, I auditioned for him and he gave me the part uh, in, in his last play, which was called Mr. Kettle and Mrs. Moon. And it was quite a while after that, that I worked with um, Peter O'Toole and, and other big names because I'd been gradually working my way up the, um, the ladder, as it were. Mm. Um, you also starred in Jack Clayton's 1959 film Room at the Top. What are your memories of that as an actress? And what are the main differences between um, film, television and the stage? A Room at the Top, I only had a tiny, tiny part in that. I was just breaking into film. I was just starting to do screen stuff. Um, and uh, it's just terribly exciting because uh, there was a wonderful cast and um, it was from a very famous book. So I've, even though I had about three lines, I, um, I felt that I was doing something really worthwhile. Uh, the difference between what? Sorry, can I ask you that again? Uh, the differences between film and television and uh, the theatre work that you've done. There isn't a lot of difference with television and film. I mean, you have your camera. And of course, when I started out in television, um, we had several cameras on the floor. Um, we rehearsed the whole thing like a play and then shot it all live in the studio, which was the scariest thing you can possibly imagine. Um, mm. And... Um, so it, it wasn't the, the difference between that, of course, and normal filming is that you, you usually have just one or two cameras and you get to shoot tiny little scenes one at a time, well rehearsed in front of the camera. Um, and uh, you get a much better go at it, really. So um, as an actress in the 60s, uh, mainly considered as a male-dominated industry, especially within BBC senior management, um, made up of sort of higher middle-class men, really. How difficult was it for a woman to secure their own tailor-made TV vehicles at the time? Wasn't difficult at all. I, I don't think what sex you were had much to do with it. It was whether you got the product and the talent and um, whether you could go out there and sell it. Um, the fact that they were male or middle class or anything had nothing to do with it. Okay. Um, uh, so you secured your first sitcom lead role in 67 for Not In Front Of The Children. Um, in what ways do you think that moved sitcom on? <laughs> I don't know whether it did, actually. It might have held it back a bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, um, what happened was, I was working on quite serious stuff in the theatre and on television. And um, we became very friendly with a comedy writer called Richard Waring. And Richard Waring said to me that 
he felt that inside this very dramatic young actress, there was a comedian and he would like to write a pilot for me. So he wrote the pilot of Not In Front Of The Children um, and sent it to me and I loved it. And I, I've, I've always liked, preferred to make people laugh really. Um, and I said, I'd love to do it. And so we did the pilot and it was very successful. And then he wrote um, a series, I think there were three, maybe four series of Not In Front of the Children. Um, and that was very, it, it did go down very well. People enjoyed seeing a family on the screen and all the funny moments that can happen in family life. Yeah. Um, so in 71 then, you starred in the ITV sitcom and Mother Makes Three, which brought you in contact with the great Carla Lane. Um, yes. We speak hmm. to a lot of actors who say that certain writers have the ability to tap into a side of human behaviour that makes it accessible for them to identify with their character. What was it about her writing that made that process work? Uh, Carla was a very special writer. Um, we were great friends. I only met her through work, but we became great friends and there was a mutual understanding between us. She, she wrote for me. She said she could hear my voice when she was writing. Um, I can't remember what the question is now. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, Josh <laughs> just uh, wanted to know um, how a, a writer like that is able to sort of make it easy for you to identify with your character? Oh, yes. Well, I think she wrote it more or less, I think, with me in mind. Um, but also there's a lot of Carla in it as well, because Rhea couldn't cook and Carla couldn't cook. And Carla was absolutely mm -hmm. hopeless in the kitchen and always said the kitchen was her enemy and was at war with her. And um, I wasn't quite as bad as that, but I'm certainly no cordon bleu chef. Mm -hmm. um, and I always heave a sigh of relief when I pour something out of the oven and it's okay. Um, and um, we, were, we were just good buddies and she understood about my life and I understood about hers. And, and so we were very compatible and it just seemed to flow and work well. Yeah, so obviously 78, um, you were cast as the modern housewife, Rhea Parkinson, um, in Butterflies. Yeah. There's so much that Josh would like to ask you about that, but firstly, what were your initial thoughts on the role? I was very excited to play it. I thought, oh, this is really great. It's like a, a step forward from the... Um, quite basic sort of comedy. It was much more subtle. The dialogue was beautiful. Uh, Carla wrote as if she was writing poetry. Um, she had a great gift for words and understanding people and empathy. Um, and so, it, yes, it felt like a, a, a really good step forward to, to be doing um, butterflies. Yeah. On the surface, Butterflies seems a gentle family situation comedy, but mm -hmm. actually it threw up quite a lot of social issues um, surrounding the sort of freedom uh, when one gets to their middle age and the ongoing sort of desires of people of that age. As an actor, how did you perfect the balance between the truth of Rhea's desires while maintaining the innocence of a family sitcom? I think uh, Carla was, was just showing, she was just representing women and probably men too, reach a certain age and then they start slightly questioning, is, is that all there is? <laughs> you know that song, is that all there is? 
And I think she was um, feeling the boys were grown up. Her husband was very occupied with other people's teeth and hunting for butterflies. And I think she suddenly found herself in a position where she didn't quite know what she was meant to do next. And I think she was lonely too. Now, I think a lot of women get like that. And, and so that was why so many women understood it. And um, I used to get letters from women saying, it's just like my life. It's like looking through my letterbox watching this show. That's exactly how I feel, restless and unfulfilled and wondering what's going to come next. Mm. Um, and I think also there was a lack of romance in her life. Her husband was kind and loving and obviously adored her, but he wasn't showing much affection. He was a dry old stick, very lovable, but dry. And I think she just wanted somebody to embrace her and say, yes, you're not a, mm. you're not a middle-aged, boring housewife. You're a beautiful woman. And I find you very attractive. She was just longing for somebody to say that to her. Mm. Uh, and of course, he came along, didn't he? I... <laughs> Me, <laughs> Josh said he was watching a documentary the other day um, mm -hmm. and they, there was a scene um, within Butterflies which would be very controversial um, in today's TV landscape. Oh, really? Josh said that they mentioned about the scene where uh, Rhea said that she wanted to be raped and how that would be, is, you know, as it was written um, then versus how it would be written now, I suppose. And Is that what she said? Yeah. She said, I want to be raped. Yeah. I can't remember that. My goodness. Yes, I can see that that wouldn't go down well in today's world at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I, I think uh, it must have been a moment of passion on Rhea's side, but um, no, I think that would probably get the blue pencil these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, so how do you think the character of Rhea and her liaison with Leonard helped to move the sitcom on? Well, I, I think it was the first time there'd been a kind of rather serious angle in a television series, a comedy series. I, I mean, it was quite serious, this business of her being chased by Leonard. And 
uh, wanting desperately to um, have him as her lover, but not daring to. Um, and I don't think that had really been covered before, certainly not in comedy. Uh, so I, I think it, it was a bit of a shock. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why people liked it. Because it did have a certain ring of truth to it. Yeah. Um, so the next question that Josh has written is about sort of the time and the era. Obviously, 70s Britain. Um, and in that time, you know, in a few years, Britain would have its first ever female prime minister. Um, yes. And the Female Discrimination Act was signed in 81. And in hindsight, what, how do you feel butterflies sort of tied into that and helped to influence that sort of equality movement and seeing uh, powerful women um, sort of before the sort of Thatcher government? Well, I'd have to think about that. I mean, that hadn't crossed my mind. I think... Um, I don't think I can politicize it at all. Mm. I think, it, it, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think Carla was thinking politically at all. And we never talked about politics or anything like that. No. No, not really. I, I don't think she had that in mind. If it, if it did happen as a sort of side issue, jolly good. <laughs> <laughs> So November 2000, the cast of Butterflies returned for a one-off special for children in need. How special was that reunion? That was a wonderful reunion. We hadn't seen each other, I think it was 20 years or something. How long was it uh, between? Oh, it was about 20 years. Over. Yeah. Probably over 20 years, yeah. Over 20 years. Uh, I remember us all getting together again, and it was just like we'd never been apart. And by then, Nicholas Lindhurst had a child, and I, I think Andrew had a child as well, and they were sort of grown-up daddies, you know, not naughty teenagers anymore, and sensible daddies, and, um, and Jeff was his... Dear self, just the same, never changed. Very sweet man. And uh, it was kind of happy and sad because the passage of time and time moving on and you think back to what it was like in those days when we were doing the show, it's kind of painful the way time moves on and everything changes um but it, it was a wonderful reunion and great to work on the show again and i don't did carla write the script yes she must have done yes she wouldn't let anyone else write it um and i think she wrote a, a really lovely script for it uh so it was magic moments for us all again for a little while mm. Last November, Britain lost an acting legend. What are your memories of the great Geoffrey Palmer? Yeah, I was very sad to hear of his passing. I won't get a Christmas card from him this year. He was divine to work with. Patient, kind gentle, wonderful actor, always, always giving to the other actor to help them on, as it were. Hmm. Um, kind to the boys, loved the boys, used to play frisbee with them. Um, he, he, was, he played many parts. He was extremely successful, but he never showed off and he was never sort of proud of himself or anything like quiet modest man who treated acting as a job and just got on with it and did it superbly yeah lovely um so 2003 you were you were cast as matron in the itv sunday night drama the royal 
Oh, yes. How, how important was that for the audience to see you in a completely different way? <laughs> well, I think that I think that they probably got used to the idea that I wasn't doing comedy anymore and that this was a now much more serious Wendy Craig. Um, and uh, I, I enjoyed it. I love putting on that uniform and that funny little cap and marching around, bossing everybody about. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so looking back at your career then, what would you say your proudest achievement is? Oh. I, I think it probably was Butterflies because that seems to have made the biggest impression of anything. I know it you can't say only a sitcom, but it was just a comedy show. But it did seem to leave quite a big impression because I still get people saying to me, oh, I used to love butterflies. And when I think how many years ago was that? 50, probably. Um, of course, the youngsters don't know what on earth that they're talking about because they've never seen it, they've never heard of it. They don't know who I am either, which is quite a relief in a way. <laughs> um, and... Um, <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, lovely. So then, us with the big question, the last question is, what's next for Wendy Craig? <laughs> oh, I don't think mm -hmm. there's a lot for Wendy Craig now. I don't get offered anything except the odd sound recording, and I I do. Um, there's a company called Big Finish Productions which do sound recordings of plays and. Um, and uh, sort of box sets for people to listen to in cars and in hospitals and things like that. And I love doing those because um, they're always good parts. I'm working with really starry people. I was with Christopher Eccleston last week and it was lovely doing a Doctor Who. Um, and I do odd jobs like that, but I don't get offered big parts anymore. No. So I, I guess I just enjoy my life in the country with my lovely grandchildren and my great grandchildren and my garden and have happy memories. Yeah, brilliant. That's lovely. Josh said that was a textbook interview. Very good. <laughs> Oh, bless him. Thank you very much, Josh. <laughs> Thank you. No, thanks very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Not at all. Uh, Lovely to meet you both. Lovely yeah, to meet you too, Josh. And and very good questions. I wish I wish all journalists were as good as you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much. Well,